Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria. Okay, well, in our overview of the Bible books, we're to the book of Acts, and it turns out we're going to spend quite a bit of time in Acts today, because what we want to see is the centrality of the resurrection to the apostolic message, to, the, to what they preached. But let's start in John. Let's start in John chapter 20. Uh, when we did Luke, we, we kind of highlighted the beginning of Luke and then the end of Luke and the resurrection uh, narrative in Luke. And I'll say more about this, Lord willing, in the worship meeting, but uh, I don't know what day it was in the last couple of days, I guess, uh, maybe yesterday. There's an article in the New York Times, an interview with an opinion columnist with the president of Union Theological Seminary. Uh, the Reverend, this is the title uh, given by somebody to this person, not by me, uh, Reverend Serene Jones. And basically, uh, I might give a couple of quotes in there, I'll just tell you the gist of it. The, the, her, her opinion is that the attachment to a physical resurrection of Jesus is a terrible threat to the Christian faith. That it's a, a, it's a wobbly faith. Um, that the notion that a God, Father, Deity would send his, her words, kid to die in order to receive the go-ahead to give um, forgiveness of sins is uh, really bad. So, so what I want us to understand is we, we don't need to take for granted when we say the words Christianity uh, or our faith, we don't need to take for granted that people understand what we mean by that is the content of the Word of God because there are presidents of seminaries who say that the content is a threat to the existence of Christianity as, as they understand it. This is, not, this is not a blip on the radar. This has been growing. Uh, it's the same stuff repeated from centuries past, but it is becoming more normative. So today, we're gonna to celebrate the historical message of the resurrection of Jesus, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Yes. And Lord willing, in our meeting, we'll be looking at a passage where Paul directly confronts the kinds of claims that this so-called Christian was making in the New York Times. And you know, the New York Times is influential, but I know a document that has sold more copies. Amen. <laughs> and has been read by more people. Uh, and that's the document and the documents we'll be looking at today. So uh, John chapter 20, this is a, a, a lengthy one, but I think uh, all of this, this chapter is helpful. Uh, well, we read the purpose statement, I guess, last week. So we'll, we'll stop at 29, but we might as well just read all of it since there's only two more. Go ahead and include the purpose statement. Uh, now for... The opportunity for participation. Let's uh, let's divide it up into sections, and we'll we'll take turns. We don't want anybody to to read if you'd rather not. But is there anybody uh, who would read verses one to ten for us? Okay, Stephen King. Thank you. And then verses eleven to eighteen. Scott, would you do that? Okay. Phyllis, would you do nineteen to twenty-three? And then we need somebody to do 24 to 29. Okay, Lynn and Tim, would you do 30 and 31? Okay, so I think that got everybody that was volunteering. Thank you for your participation today. 
and I can't remember who has what passage, so when it's your turn, just read, and we'll hear John chapter 20. Uh, we, you know, you understand the previous events, Jesus' crucifixion and his burial. Um, verse 39 of chapter 19 is an, a notable name uh, from earlier in the book of John, Nicodemus. Uh, when we saw Nicodemus in chapter 3, he, his whole religious career had been crushed. And, and, and he was told, you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Jesus called him the teacher of Israel, told him that the spirit is like the wind. And, and we, don't, we can't control it. We don't know. We just see the results, results of the wind. We know we see the results of the work of the spirit, but the spirit works as he wills. Uh, but uh, in a sermon from John MacArthur I heard in John 3, he said somewhere between John 3 and John 19, the wind blew. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise God. So Nicodemus is there helping. And he's, um, he, they have uh, taken him there. With verse 42 says, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. And we'll pick up there. So, 1 to 10. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciples, and they were going to the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' Jesus's head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, in 11 to 18. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came out and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the, for the, of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twins, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But we have, he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into the side, I will never believe you. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. But it is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Praise God. Uh, I have a question, Mike. <clears throat> yes, sir. In the first section there, the other disciples. That was almost certainly John. Um, often in his in his book, in his gospel, when he's talking about himself, he'll say something like that. <clears throat> when he's talking about the others, he just names them usually. So just okay. a little modesty um, when he's writing about himself. Uh, so I guess uh, he didn't want to embarrass Peter by saying, and then I smoked Peter <laughs> on the way to the tomb and outran him. <laughs> so he just said the other disciple outran Peter. Although they were shy about saying the one that Jesus loved. That's right. He did say that a lot, the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, one thing that uh, stood out to me here is when is the, the, the encounter there with Mary. Um, She didn't know what to do, I guess, except just sit there, stay there, thinking. I mean, I'm sure she was stunned trying to put it all together. Um, and Jesus just spoke her name. And that, that seems very personal and tender to me. And then contrast what he said to her to go... He said, go to my brothers. This is the one who's just conquered death. And he's talking about these guys that have just uh, a few days earlier, after he told them what was going to happen, they had had a debate among themselves about who's the greatest. And he just conquered death, and he called his brothers. And then he said, I'm ascending to my father and your father. To my God and your God. So, from the very beginning, he was teaching them, what I've done applies to you. And contrast that with <clears throat> what he had said in John in numerous occasions with the Jewish religious leaders. Um, he didn't call them brother. He acknowledged you are the descendants of Abraham, but you're of your father, the devil. So, what, what makes the difference? Faith makes the difference. Trusting Him. Knowing Him. Um, even if you're the teacher of Israel, Jesus doesn't consider you His brother unless you trust Him. I find that very uh, also that moving out that uh, given in that culture he appears to Mary, you know, uh, and has right. her be the witness to go to the right. disciples because her witness would not have been counted, right? You know, as as anything. Yeah, I was reading an article this morning about how uh, the the evidence is that this is a historical account, and that was one of the points. If the apostles wanted to make it the most credible, if they were just crafting a story that would be the most believable, they would not paint themselves in the light in that culture of hold up and afraid while the ladies were out and working, taking care, doing the next thing that needed to be done uh, with Jesus' body. And Jesus sends Mary. Go, go tell them. So, yep. <clears throat> Mary got to hear Jesus say her name before Peter, James, and John 
Yeah. Michael, one detail that I hadn't noticed before, in verse 7 it says, And the face of cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but pulled it up in a place by itself. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I had forgotten, or it just became apparent to me, that if Jesus immediately ascended to the Father, the cloth should just be lying there. But it's interesting that it's folded in a different place. Mm-hmm. Yet Jesus told Mary, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Mm-hmm. So that extreme detail. <clears throat> that's right. He folded in places. That's Mary's right. Self. He, yeah, that's, I, I was just thinking that too as we were reading that I guess when he sat up, or, you know, I, who knows, I don't know how powerfully, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if all of a sudden he was standing, I don't, but, I would think that the you remember when he he uh, raised Lazarus, there was the detail of loose him, let him you know because he was all wrapped up in all the burial stuff. So was Jesus, and so I'm thinking the most practical explanation is if you were wrapped from head to toe, standing, what's the first thing you would uh, you you would you know it probably wouldn't be the part around your knee, it'd be the part around your your head. So. Yeah. I've got um, I've done some research on this and, and when it talks about them bringing a hundred pounds of myrrh and anoint the body with the myrrh myrrh was like shellac and, mm. and, and from what I can find out what they did was was like dip the strips in this myrrh uh, then so, it wrapped, like cast. so it would be a, mm. a cast and I believe that's why John believed because he saw this 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 cool. cast of Jesus realizing that the only way that the body could get out of there is supernaturally. Okay. Yeah. And um, and the second point is that there was an angel sitting at the head and at the foot. Okay, so if the you know if the if the cloths were just in a jumble, uh, there would be no head or foot. Right. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Helpful. Helpful. So, yeah, these are this, this reads like eyewitness. There are details that uh, make it seem like a person witnessed this and was telling the story. Not just this is not just a theologically loaded. Uh, it's 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 not. I mean, it is obviously. I mean, we're talking about the resurrection from the dead. But it, he wasn't writing a chapter in a theology book right here. He's telling, this is what happened on that day as I experienced it. Even the race to the tomb, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> we're uh, planning to sing a song this morning that has this encounter between Jesus and Mary in the, in the middle of the song. It's good. I'm... Uh, We haven't heard physically Jesus call our names, but spiritually we've experienced that by being born again. I believe um, the song says after the personal tender encounter, this is the voice that spans the years. And it just, it's powerful to think of the one who conquered death uh, having a personal interest in each one of us individually. Mm -hmm. Knowing this. So, the way he dealt with Mary, the way he dealt with Thomas, very personal, uh, lordly, tender, brotherly, um, you know, he didn't directly reprimand, reprimand Thomas. He just gave a blessing <laughs> to those who hear the story and believe without saying, not until I see some evidence. Because that's not irrational. I mean, we're talking about a person rising from the grave. 
the Lord doesn't expect us to just when people walk up and say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? He, he died, and then three days later he rose. Oh, that's cool. He doesn't expect us to treat it like that. I mean, this is the event. This is the crushing of death. Um, now, death is still around, but there's coming a time when death, in some way, will be thrown into the lake of fire. I, I'm thinking that uh, it may be figuratively when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. I don't know, but in some way, we will all recognize there's no more death. Uh, death is banished. It's been conquered uh, for those who are in Christ, but it's but it's still present. There's coming a time when it won't be present anymore. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Jesus is already thinking of the mission. And as we look into a few of the Acts um, apostolic, uh, episodes of apostolic preaching, we're going to see how central the, the, uh, the resurrection is. It, it, it's, it's not a superstition that is attached to an, uh, a Jewish teacher who just told us to be nice to everybody. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the Jesus and the resurrection uh, of Union Theological Seminary. The empty tomb, she says, uh, symbolizes that death can't, co uh, can't conquer uh, love and <clears throat> That sounds real nice and all, but I'm, I'm like, okay, so how, how is that? Because I think there are people who have seen their loved ones die and don't feel like love has conquered. They feel like their loved ones have died. Or people who are dying are not feeling very victorious uh, throughout human history, and I'm suspecting that, you know, I pray that the Lord would would save this reverend. Um, but I'm thinking that when she gets to the point of her deathbed, she will not feel that her Christianity is adequate for the conquering of death. I think she will feel very conquered by death at that moment. And uh, so I just... <clears throat> Implore you, let's let's stick with what the apostles said. You know, when you start thinking about this, there were people who thought that way even then, and then there were people who had a different ideological approach to religion, who were determined to protect it no matter what. The Jewish religious leaders, the Roman political leaders, and uh, <clears throat> the fact that the 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 apostles, all of them, maintained the story of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, even though it didn't help them, they didn't get money, fame, or fortune by sticking to this. Instead, they got persecution and martyrdom. Persecution, imprisonment, martyrdom, shame, uh, kicked out of the synagogues, considered uh, scum by their own religious people who were thought of as pious. There was nothing to gain for them. Uh, except that it was true and that what was gained was life. <laughs> so the other stuff was just circumstances. So let's look at a couple of these passages at least. Um, I, I know we won't, we won't get to all of them, but the, the resurrection, Luke wrote Acts and he started here we read this when we looked at Luke, but in Acts 1, in the first book of Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Uh, here again, we got Luke. He uses courtroom language in, in the prologue in Luke. He's saying, he mentions eyewitnesses, he mentions his own investigation, very careful. Uh, he says this is exactly what happened so that you can be certain of it. And now he's talking about proof. Uh, Luke is saying this is undeniable. This is, this is the only rational conclusion for the events 
that Jesus is Lord. That's that's what's true. Anything else is silliness. That's basically Luke's standpoint. He's not saying, well, you have to look at it all through the lens of faith. That's so far into Luke's approach. <laughs> he's not denying faith, but what he's at this is the difference in the Bible and all the other religions. The Bible is asking us not just to believe, but to believe the truth. Mm-hmm. Believe the truth. Mm-hmm. Other religions say believe in spite of what may seem or not seem to be true. So, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, this is important. We know what happened at Pentecost. Uh, They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus called this the promise of the Father. Uh, Peter's going to refer to this in just a moment. And we do need to understand that in church history, there have been a lot of many, many, many people, many churches have connected the promise of the Father with water baptism, which led inevitably to think that the idea that baptism saves. Because we know we have to have the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. That's a definition of salvation. Do you not know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you? That's what Paul said in the Corinthians. And he said to the Romans, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. You don't belong to Christ if you don't have the Spirit. And when the connection got made of water baptism and the promise of the Father of the Holy Spirit, then we got baptismal regeneration, uh, which is not taught in Scripture because Jesus is saying, you're about to experience the promise of the Father, and they did, and nobody got water baptized then. This was truly a spirit baptism, an immersion in the Spirit to be empowered for work. Uh, So that's just a little ecclesiology there to know. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, if you're going to pursue something other than the understanding that Jesus the Messiah will return and then set up his kingdom on the earth, like it says in all the prophets, you're going to have to deal with the fact that at this point, this far into it, after the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples seem to be unified in the belief that there's going to be an earthly kingdom of the Messiah headquartered in Jerusalem. So if you're, if you're going to say, no, that's not what's going to happen, you're going to have to show when the disciples departed from that belief which had been held for hmm, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, the intertestamental writing of Jewish people writing about religious things show that there was an expectation of an earthly messianic kingdom. So, anyway, that's another thing that we're seeing here in Acts 1. He said, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when He had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is interesting that the book of Acts opens its foundational, uh, the, the resurrection is in foundational. It's as if, if he didn't bodily rise from the grave, then there's no, there's nothing to act upon. But he did. And he presented himself alive, many infallible proofs. And from the resurrected Lord came the commission to go make disciples. And the promise of the Holy Spirit to empower them in this mission. And uh, the reference to the end, the, the kingdom uh, restored to Israel. And, and him saying, he didn't correct that, by the way. That would have been the place to say, Fellas, <laughs> you've missed it. I'm not going to do that. But that's not what he said. He just said, it's not for you to know the time. You just do your work. And here's your work. You're my witnesses. So, uh, I mean, that's the same way as if, if you ask me, 
Michael, are you going to Australia on Tuesday? And I said, well, not Tuesday. You would not conclude, huh, he's not going to Australia. <laughs> that would be an implied affirmation that I am going to do that, but not on the date that you were thinking. So will you, at this moment, restore the kingdom? It's not for you to know the time. So that's a strong, very strong implication is that he is going to do that. They just, they don't need to worry about that. They got work to do. Mm -hmm. And then the resurrected Lord ascends into heaven. And that is the starting point for the acts of the Holy Spirit empowered apostles. Uh, so <clears throat> the resurrection is the foundation upon which the church carries out the mission. If there's no bodily resurrection, there is no church and there is no mission. Amen. And there's also no hope and no victory and no reason for us to meet and worship God and celebrate because it's, I don't know what to tell you except what I read uh, John Cougar Mellencamp said one day in an article in I think it was USA Today, he said, when I was growing up, man, I was, I loved the music. Still love music, but I thought, when I get a hit, when I make it, that's going to be the most fulfilling. I mean, all the years of work, I'm going to be there. He said, then I got there, and I got it. Had numerous hits, and discovered, nope, life is still life. So he said, I don't know what to tell people anymore. I just tell people, just, you know, try to enjoy a party, and then you die. So, <laughs> I think we got a better reason to, to to assemble here today than he did. But that I, I gotta agree with him though. Outside of Christianity, I might. What else is there? There's nothing else, is there? But that's not that. That's that's the world. This is what we have. We've got angelic witness. We've got the Lord saying, "Get busy." We've got the angels. Uh, what are you, you just going to stand here <laughs> and look in the sky? Uh, he's coming, so get busy. And they do, and that's what the book of Acts is about. But in their preaching, the, the resurrection is not in the background. It's not in the background. It's the claim. It's the claim. Jesus is not unique because he died, is he? He's not even unique in that culture because he was crucified. He's different than every other one because he conquered death and rose from the grave. Amen. That is the validating, vindicating uh, identification of who he is. Death did not affect him like it does everybody else because it had no dominion over him in the first place. Um, he's the author of life. So, so let's look at a few of these places. Acts 2, the first... Uh, Holy Spirit empowered Christian sermon um, after the life and ministry of, of Jesus. And I got down 22 to 36, but we're rapidly running out of time. Let's just look at verse, uh, yep, we'll start in 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus. Now look at the two things he says about him. First of all, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God on the one hand. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men on the other. So who, who killed Jesus, God or man? The answer to that is yes, uh, but one was the cause of the other, ultimately. Although God didn't make anybody do anything they didn't want to do. Judas did what he wanted to do, and it was decreed and prophesied in Scripture. Pilate did what he wanted to do, but it was decreed and prophesied in Scripture. Uh, and, and by the way, if you want to see that, Acts 4 Verses 27 and 28, um, <clears throat> the early church 
after the apostles were released by the, the leaders there and they got back together, <clears throat> they had a prayer meeting. <clears throat> In verse 24, they address God as sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father David your servant said by the Holy Spirit one of the Gentiles raised and by the way that's an affirmation of the inspiration of scripture in the early church which has been denied it's amazing to me people scholars can come up with this stuff well the early church didn't believe in the inspiration of scripture it? which uh, sovereign Lord who through the mouth of our father David your servant said by the Holy Spirit that's the doctrine of inspiration in Scripture. But look what he says. Look what they pray in 27 and 28. Truly in this city that were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That's their prayer, and that's what Peter said first. Uh, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, and we know that Jesus on a number of times said, I'm not a victim. Another thing that the Union Theological Seminary president said to connect to our current climate is that this is a social justice opportunity. She didn't, she didn't use those words, but I think it's pretty clear. She said the crucifixion was a lynching. Um, yes, in some ways, except that the one who was lynched is the author of the event. Uh, which I'm sure she would deny because she said she didn't worship an all-knowing, all-powerful God that God doesn't exist. But So so Peter says in verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This is an affirmation of the deity of Christ. What he's basically saying is you cannot kill God. You cannot. Amen. It's not possible. He gives evidence uh, of how the psalm uh, there applies to Jesus. Because David's saying it and using the personal pronoun I about uh, you will not have, I saw the Lord there 27, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. But look what he says in verse 29, common sense. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. I mean, he was able to gesture. There's some corruption that's happening right there. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah, of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So, uh, in verse 34, David did not ascend into the heavens. <laughs> uh, so his conclusion there in verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom he crucified. Mm -hmm. he, he's a risen Savior. And this is excellent application of the Scripture to an audience who would have known this passage from the Psalms, and he's saying somebody did not see corruption. We've got that in our scripture. And there's David's tomb. It wasn't David. It wasn't the person saying, you will not let me. It's some, who's he speaking about? These words are the Messiah's words spoken through, through David. And Jesus is the one who didn't see corruption, who was raised up, and who is Lord and Christ. And by the way, <clears throat> there are those who have tried to say what we need to get people to do is acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior and they'll be saved. And then maybe sometime in their Christian life we can persuade them that He's also Lord and they obey Him. But that's not, you know, that's, that's not important. But the first sermon of Christian history is... God has made him both Lord and Christ. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> I don't think we have to go any further than that to see Jesus is Lord. Is, and that literally, those are the words that you're to confess. Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> Not, I acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior and, that he, and I'm going to let him take me to heaven. But I'm not going to do what he says. That is not a salvation confession. Uh, because God made him both Lord and Christ. 
All right, we're out of time, but let me just show you a few of these resurrection references in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 15. Peter is speaking in Solomon's portico. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. So, that's, that's what we get here. Okay, let's look in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. Let's look at 10. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. Well, Acts 5, 17 to 32 is another uh, sermon. Verse 30, and he's talking to the Jewish religious leaders here. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and savior. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And I believe right there he was saying, you're... You're supposedly the leaders of Israel. You're fighting this event. This is how God is giving forgiveness to Israel through this, uh, through Jesus who was crucified and rose again. Okay, la last one. Look at Acts 17. Lest somebody say, well, okay, so the apostles, when they're on their home turf talking to other Jews so they can cite the the prophets and the Psalms. But what about if they get to the sophisticated cosmopolitan philosophical epicenter of Athens, um, where people still talk about the leading philosophers, even now, uh, people in the university over there are studying people who said smart sounding things from Athens. Here's what Paul preached. Acts 17, beginning in 30. The times of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. So that's still what's happening today. And this is still our message. No matter how many seminary presidents say this can't be the message or we're going to drive Christianity to the ground, <laughs> this is the only message we have. Amen. He is Amen. risen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Help us to not be enticed by popularity or anything else in this world and away from the gaining of our own souls in salvation. Lord, may your will be done. We love you. Bless this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.